Hello guys, this is PanzerMeister36, and today's video is going to be episode 4 in the standard weathering procedure series of videos I'm doing on YouTube. These videos are full hour-long weathering tutorials where I go from the bare plastic of the model up to the finished product as you can see here. In this video we're going to be focusing on weathering this Panzer Grey tank. This is a Sturm Infantry Geschütz 33, which fought in Stalingrad. I've previously done videos where I did a winter whitewash on one vehicle, I did a like a yellow and green curse camouflage on another, and I also did one with a uh, Deutsches Afrika Corps African kind of sand camouflage. In this video, I try to be a little more realistic with my approach towards weathering, where I focus mainly on just keeping the chipping very, very refined, only in the areas where it would really occur, and made the tank mostly just kind of dusty and greasy, which is what you actually see in photos. Ch tanks never really got chipped up, so I'm trying to be as realistic as possible on this one. Just making it look like it's been, you know, fighting for about a month in Stalingrad. It's pretty beat up, but it's not, you know, chipped and rusted to hell. Now this video is an hour long, it is a quite long video, but this is truly a full weathering tutorial. We're going to start with the model in a bare plastic finish. First we're going to look at applying the base paint of the Panzer Grey, we're going to airbrush that on. Then we're going to apply some markings with masks. We're going to use some paints to create some chipping effects, we're going to do two-tone chipping. We're also going to look at detail painting the tools, as well as the tracks and other details in the vehicle. We're going to cover the application of varnishes to protect our base finish. And then we're going to apply an oil pin wash to accentuate details. We're going to do some oil streaking as well as some oil rendering effects to make the tank look nice and weathered. And then we're also going to look at using pigments and other products for the mud effects in the lower areas of the tank. And we'll finish it all off with a light dusting of snow. I hope you guys enjoy this video. This is of course just my way of weathering a tank. You can have your own methods, there's no problem with that as long as you're happy with the results. This video is mainly meant to be more of just a guide and helping you if you're a beginner figuring out how to use certain types of products or do certain techniques. This video will definitely help you there. And um, I guess I should tell you now to sit back with some row wheels to sand or some free model tracks to pin because we're getting started. Here is the model as I started in the bare plastic finish. As you can see, it's just plastic, photo etched, metal gun barrel, uh, workable tracks and stuff like that. But there wasn't a lot of resin or photo etch, honestly, so I didn't bother with any primer. You don't really need to worry about that fancy stuff too much because we're gonna paint it with a Tammy acrylic and they're very durable. We're gonna begin this video by looking at base painting the just flat colors of the tank. We're going to use Tamiya XF69 for a base coat and then a mix of that along with XF72 for the tracks. And we're going to mix up XF63, 2, and 18 to make a nice dark gray blue Panzer Grey color. And we're going to be thinning these all down with Tamiya's lacquer thinner. You can use X20A if you want. And the airbrush I'm going to be using throughout this entire video is a trusty, rugged Badger 105 Patriot. It's an excellent airbrush. We're going to first apply a kind of like a primer shadow coat sort of thing, which is uh, straight up XF69 NATO black. You can use normal black, doesn't really matter. I thin it down about 60-70% with lacquer thinner there, and just mix it up until it has a nice kind of flow pattern down the side of the cup. 60-70% is pretty good. What I'm doing here is just kind of briefly testing it, which is something you get with experience. So it's important to airbrush in a few thin coats. Don't just do one coat for your airbrush application of the paint. It's going to give you a terrible finish. You want to do about two to three thin passes, as you can see. I'm going back and forth just to make sure I cover everything. The point, the point of this black is just to give it like an overall unifying coat. And if I miss anything later with the gray, the black is going to, you know, just be like a nice shadow where that area I missed was. So I base painted basically everything in the black here. That's our initial coat. It's pretty alright, but just make sure you cover everything with this coat. The finish doesn't need to be perfect, just cover everything. This is like your insurance policy right here. You might be wondering why I glued the tracks to the wheels. That's because I want to try this kind of new technique I see people doing where they just do that whole thing in one step. So I I'd add some of the XF72 to the mix of XF69 that's already in my airbrush. About a 50-50 mix, this is my usual track color, just a dark browny gray color. And we apply a little more thinner because I added more paint. We mix it up nicely. And then we apply this to the tracks. Now I'm kind of being a little bit careful here not to get on the wheels. 
but if I get a little bit of overspray, it doesn't really matter because any mud and dust later is going to just be brown on the wheels. So it's going to kind of blend it. I also paint this on the exhaust just because they should kind of be a little bit rusty. Now we're going to mix up our Panzer Grey. My mix of Panzer Grey is two parts XF63, two parts XF18, and then one part XF2. So it's equal parts of the gray and then the blue and then half of equal part of that of the white. And this like this gives me a nice Panzer Grey color. It has a little bit of a blue tint to it, but not that much. The camera kind of accentuates it when I zoom in a lot. Make sure you thin it down again with 60% thinner. And I, th I like this color. I was very happy with how this came out because I didn't want it to be too light. The new thing now is to do like a super light Panzer Grey. And honestly, if you look at color photos, that stuff was dark. Sometimes it looks like the rubber of the wheels. Like you cannot even tell the parts sometimes. So I'm trying to go for a nice dark gray here with a little bit of blue and a little bit of lightness to it. On the wheels, I'm just spraying this freehand. It doesn't really matter if there's a little bit of overspray. Because once again, any mud or dust on there is going to blend it out. And the difference in color between the rubber of the tires, which is just XF69, and this Panzer Grey is, is minuscule. So doing this as one step actually kind of made it a lot easier to paint. It went went way faster. Here is our completed base painted tank. As you can see, I actually left the gun barrel in the XF69, the initial color, to just give it a little bit of pop. And sometimes the guns were left in the primer color, which was dark gray. And you can see the tracks in the wheels here. There's a little bit of difference between the, the rubber tires color, but not really. Overall, I think it came out pretty nice. So here you can see the actual color once I zoom in a little bit. It's darker than it actually appears once I zoom in a little bit, and I think I nailed the Panzer Grey color perfectly. Next up, we're going to apply the markings to our tank. This vehicle is pretty basic, it just has a couple crosses on it. For that, we're going to use these masks by DN Models. I've used these masks a lot, but I've only ever actually used the crosses. Hopefully someday I'll get to use some more of them. Well, we're also just going to use white and black, NATO black, for the actual dark and light colors of the crosses. These masks are very useful. Like I said, I've been reusing them for a while because you can just stick them on and off the model. They're super low tack. Make sure I line them up nicely with the, the edge there so they're square. And since I'm cheap, I use blue painter's masking tape to mask off the rest. So I just paint on some Tamiya flat white. Once again, about 60% thinner. Peel it off, and there's our nice white section of the cross. The only tricky part about using these masks is lining up the second half. You gotta make sure you line up perfectly. And I just reuse the same tape. And now we paint on our NATO black. Once again, about 60% thinner. And there it is. That's perfect. Well, that's actually a little bit imperfect, which looks good. We put the masks back on the paper for next time. So I love using these masks because I don't have to worry about applying a varnish for the decals or the decals silvering. You just paint them on like you would anything else. And this is how they were applied in real life. And they get slight imperfections to them, which I think looks even more realistic than a perfect decal. I really recommend masks, and these DN model ones are, are really, really good. So if you can get them, highly recommend it. We're going to start the actual weathering of this tank, finally, with some chipping effects. We're going to do some two-tone chipping here. So first we're going to need a light gray mixed of just these two colors here, lighter than the Panzer Gray. We're going to thin it with X28 thinner. You could also use water or lacquer thinner, doesn't really matter. And we're also going to use this model color German camouflage black brown for the second color in the two-tone chipping. This will be our rusty primer color. So for the chipping effects, I've got a 10 over 0 brush here, a very small round brush, and also some sponge. I'll show you how to use both these in just a minute. I'm going to start by just mixing up a lighter gray, panzer gray kind of color. So the first part of the chipping is kind of like the highlight, the scuff color. So you want a slightly lighter version of your base color of the tank. That could be a light green if it's a Russian tank, a light yellow if it's a like a Dunkelgelp tank or in this case, is a light gray. So I'm doing about a 50-50 mix of both those paints. I didn't worry about applying any blue. Don't need the, the blue Panzer Gray tint here, just the black and the white's fine. 
50-50 mix and a little bit of water or X28 to, to it. And then we start to apply the chipping pattern. So when you're chipping, it's important to not actually try to paint chipping effects. The brush will make the chips for you if you have a small enough brush like I do here. Just kind of let the brush make the chipping pattern for you. Scrapes are a little bit tricky. Make sure you want to get a little bit of paint in your brush. But if you just kind of go back and forth a little bit, you can build up some convincing scrapes. It's very easy to overdo this effect with too much paint, so try to be really subtle. I frequently clean off my brush to make sure it stays nice and pointy, even though this is a pretty terrible brush to be honest. Brush off most of the paint, then we're going to apply some more chips. Like I said at the start of the video, I tried to keep my chipping very refined on this tank to make it realistic because honestly, these tanks barely ever got chipped up at all. If you look at photos, you can hardly ever see any chipping. These tanks were painted quite durably and they didn't really survive long enough to get chipped up like we see on construction equipment. If you're having trouble painting the chips with a brush, you can of course use a piece of foam sponge. I've torn off a little piece here and then I just kind of fold it over, dip it in a little bit of paint and then wipe off most of it. Basically wipe off all of it. If you've ever done dry brushing, you know that you only want a tiny bit of paint on that thing. And the natural kind of shape of the of the foam sponge, if you just lightly touch it, gives you actually a very convincing chipping effect. Just make sure you only have a little bit of paint on that sponge. For the second color of the two-tone chipping, we're using German camouflage black brown by model color. This is the perfect color for this effect in my opinion. It's very thick though, so I thin it down with a little bit of water, um, actually a lot of water because it's super thick. And the thinner the paint here, the easier it is to get nice fine chipping effects. So I'm just testing the consistency here to make sure it's nice and thin. And then we'll start applying our second color of chipping. Now this, this primer color is something you don't want to apply very much of. It's very easy to overdo this effect by putting this everywhere. What you want to do with this color is only apply in the center of the largest chips of the previous color. So you see I'm not putting it everywhere. I'm only just picking the biggest chips that I, already, that I previously did and applying a little bit of this inside of them. This simulates these bigger chips having actually been scraped down to like the, the bare metal or the primer underneath. I'm probably only applying the red primer to maybe one out of five of the previous scrapes because you want most of your chipping to be subtle and that previous lighter scuff color, the light gray in this case, that is subtle and looks realistic. If you do the red primer everywhere, it's going to look out of control. So you got to make sure you keep this refined and only pick the certain heaviest areas of chipping and a little bit of this color to them. So here's the result of the chipping effects on our tank. Chipping is an excellent way to add a nice realistic effect to your tank, make it look like it's made of real metal and is actually seen combat. But chipping is also very, very easy to overdo. On this vehicle, I kept it extremely refined, but honestly, this is probably still more than any of these tanks even got chipped up in real life. It got toned down later with the dusty effects that I apply with oils. But right now, I mean, it looks pretty cool but I could even go lighter than this and the tank would still look realistic. Chipping is an excellent way to accentuate details like exposed edges and rivets and also highlight the areas that the crew would walk around the most like the hatches and stuff like that. Overall, it's a great way to add a nice lived in effect in your tank and it's pretty easy to do. This next part here isn't exactly weathering, but I gotta cover it anyways. This is the boring part where we paint the tools and other stuff like that. Yeah, not very fun, but here's everything we're going to be using. I'll look at each paint individually for each detail I'm painting, though. 
So I start by mixing up some of that model color German camouflage black brown and Tami XF63 in about equal parts to get a nice dark gray color. I'm going to use this to paint the tow cable. I'm also thinning this down with a little bit of water, about 50% or so. And then I'm just kind of brushing it onto the tow cable because you got to paint the details, you know. It's not fun, but you got to do it. For the metal end of the axe, I'm just using straight up XF63, thinned a little bit. There's no mixing with the brown this time. And then on the handle, I base painted this with Panzer Ace's 310 Old Wood, which is like the perfect wood color for everything in my opinion. It's perfect. So I've never really figured out how to paint wood nicely, but this was the best time I've done it in my opinion. So I'm still kind of making up my wood thing as I go. What I did here is I stippled on a mix of, well, not a mix, but individually. I've got XF72, XF59, and XF2. And I'm just kind of like stippling, almost like making chipping effects of those three colors back and forth over the previous wood color. And that's kind of to give me a wood grain. And it came out actually really nice. So I think I'll stick with that from now on. And here I get to flex my uh, Alliance Model Works workable tool clamp so I can put my axe back in. I love this. This is awesome. These things work like the real thing. Isn't that cool? Now we're going to use some Tamiya X27 Clear Red to paint the headlight, or sorry, the, the rear light on the back of the tank. I thin this a little bit with, with water and just kind of paint it on to give us that, that red lens color. And I also used XF69 once again, and this was for the machine gun on the front. Just painted it on, nothing special there. And there we go. Hopefully I got through that step as quickly as possible. I know it's kind of boring to see me painting stuff like that, but you want to see the weathering. I know that's going to be coming up soon. But I just want to show you guys how I paint tools and wood and stuff like that. Also note, I didn't paint the fire extinguisher red. They were always painted externally, the base color of the tank in real life. All right, now I want to make an important distinction. I get questions about this a lot. The weathering stages that we're going to be doing next are going to be using products that are thinned with enamel thinner. These are products like oil paints, enamel washes, and so on. Any streaking grime, filter, anything like that you can buy in a bottle, and oil paints all work like this. The previous weathering effects that we've already done, and also the base painting and the detail painting, are all done with acrylic paints, as you can see here. Acrylic paints dry nice and quickly and durably. When once they're on, you can't really take them off without stripping the model. So they're very good for chipping effects and detail painting and stuff you don't really need to do any cleanup on. The next weathering steps we're going to do, like an oil pin wash, as I'm showing here, you want to use oil paints or enamels for these because you always have excess, like you can see here, that you want to clean up. You can't use acrylic paints for that because you wouldn't be able to clean up the excess. So these oil paints and enamel paints are thinned down with oil or enamel thinners. They're all the same. As you can see here, I've got Wild Earth Thinner and AK White Spirit. They work the same way. And these products are not compatible with acrylic paints. You can't thin down acrylic paints with oil thinners or vice versa. So these are enamel thinners here, and these are acrylic thinners here. And they don't mix. So with that distinction out of the way, we're going to apply a varnish to our tank to protect the previous acrylic weathering effects from the enamel effects we're going to be applying next, enamel and oil effects. For that, we're going to be using a mix of about half and half Tami X22 clear, which is just like pure gloss. As you can see, it's very, very clear. And, and also half of this XF86, which is like a kind of flat varnish. And I'm mixing them about 60% again with Tami Lacquer Thinner with the yellow cap. You could use X20A, which is the acrylic thinner, but I chose the lacquer thinner to make my varnish extra durable. So I did a mix of gloss and flat varnish, as you can see there, about 50-50, to give me a satin varnish, about a semi-gloss, like halfway between. As you can see, there it is on the tank. So it's a little bit shiny, but it's not super shiny because we don't want it super glossy, otherwise our weathering isn't going to stick. But we don't want it super matte 
otherwise we're not going to be able to remove the excess. So I'm just I've mixed it up in my airbrush about half and half of each of the uh, the, of the gloss and the flat and then about 60 70 percent thinner and then as with the previous paints we apply in a few thin coats letting it build up in two to three thin layers. You can also buy this stuff in cans and spray it on that probably should work fine I just like to airbrush it on because I have more control. Make sure you apply it everywhere and get that nice kind of shiny finish but not too shiny. Semi-gloss satin is what I like. You can see how shiny it is there. It's not like blinding you but it is a little bit shiny if you catch in the light. With the protective varnish applied we can now move on to the actual well the oil and enamel weathering effects which are my favorite part. We're going to start by applying an oil pin wash to the tank. For this, we're going to be using a bunch of oil paints here. I've got the Wilder Brown Shadow, which is a very, very dark brown, and also Black Knight, which is pure black. I've also got Wilder Thinner here to thin it down, and also a 20 over 0 round brush, which is very, very small. And we're also going to need a little medicine cup here to mix up our pin wash inside. So for my dark brown pin wash, I'm doing about a half and half mix of the brown and the black oil paints here. Now I know you could buy enamel products that are, you know, you buy like a MIG wash in a bottle or an AK or a MIG or whatever wash in a bottle. Those work the same way, but I like oils because I can mix it up myself. I can pick the color perfectly. And also it's cheaper to just buy oil paints and thinner than buying those big bottles that are mostly just thinner in the end anyways, right? So I mix up the black and the brown equal parts and then we apply a ton of thinner because we want this to be about 80%, 90% thinner to 10% oil paint basically. You want this to be super thin because you want to flow nicely and you, know, you want to have a lot of control when you apply it. So you see there's, there's a lot of thinner in there. I mix it up and make sure you keep mixing so it gets all nicely uh, thinned down. And as usual I'm testing the, the consistency on the side here and seeing how well it flows. And depending on how well it flows, that's how I judge how nicely thin it is. So the oil pin wash is probably the most effective weathering effect there is. The, the pin wash is designed to accentuate the shadows and the edges of details to make everything more apparent, make the details pop out, and make the tank look larger than it is and make it look like a real tank, not a scale model. So it's important you apply it to basically all the little details. Every seam line, every weld, every rivet, every hinge, everything. Got to give it a light a light pass with the uh, with the pin wash here. So you see when I, when I just put a little bit in these little bolt holes there. You, know, you barely even saw them before but suddenly they now pop out. One thing I'm testing my thinner there and I'm also brushing off most of it because I don't want to flood the model. I only want a little bit of my brush at once so I can keep it nice and controlled. And since we applied the semi-gloss varnish, this actually, it'll stick around the details, but it won't kind of spread out. If your tank is a matte finish and you start to apply this around a weld, it'll, it'll just flow out across the side of the tank and it doesn't look very good. You want the semi-gloss varnish, you can easily apply this around the details and so that it kind of flows around into all the gaps and seams around the rivets and welds and stuff. So we always end up with excess and the way to remove this is just take some of the same thinner and just wipe away you know any there's a little bit of extra there on that vent so I'm just wiping it off with a little bit of thinner on my brush. You can let the pin wash dry for like 10 minutes then just grab a little bit of thinner and you, and you say, oh, there's a little bit of excess around this weld seam here. And you'd wipe that away so only the paint, the, the, the pin wash, is left around the weld seam. This is, this is another reason why we applied the varnish. We don't want to damage the acrylic paint when we're rubbing this thinner on it. Tamiya should be fine, but certain acrylic paints like Vallejo are kind of weak and can be damaged by even enamel thinner. So it's always a good idea to apply a varnish just to be safe. And 
And here's our model with the completed oil pen wash. As you can see, suddenly, all the details are more apparent, and the tank looks a lot more realistic because you can actually see all the welds and rivets and everything like that. And this also serves to kind of unify the chipping with the rest of the tank for some reason. I think it's just because of the dark brown color kind of mimics the red primer effect of some of the chipping. Like I said previously, the oil pin wash is probably the most effective weathering technique out there. And if you're going to do any weathering on your tank, this should be it because this is amazing. It really makes your tank look realistic. It's also pretty easy to do. If you want to mix up your own paint like I did, you can just buy a bottle of MIG or whatever pin wash basically. Apply it yourself and get a little bit of thinner and wipe away the excess. The next welding effect we're going to look at is what we call like rendering, filtering, dot filtering, dot streaking, all that stuff. We're going to be using more oil paints for this. I've got the wilder colors blue patina and light buff, as well as these two MIG ammo oil brushers, colors dust and starship filth. We're going to be using again the same thinner because these are still oil paints. This is wilder enamel thinner. I've got a couple of brushes here. I've got a small round one. This is a 10 over zero, I believe. That's for small applications. I've got this here. This is a 1 8 inch angular shader. Very useful for blending. And then here I've got a number four flat. And this is useful for blending out streaks. This might look kind of terrifying what I'm doing right now. But remember, these are oil paints. They can be cleaned up very easily. So this can all be wiped away. I'm using this blue to add some kind of discoloration to the tank. So I get a little bit of thinner on my brush after I applied the blue. Only a little bit of thinner. Like there's nothing coming off, basically. And then we kind of blend it out. But you don't want to blend it all the way. You want to leave some. And this is kind of like discoloration rendering, sort of. There's all these terms and they're all kind of interchangeable. What I'm really doing here is kind of what we call color modulation. You can do this with the airbrush sometimes when you're just kind of using different colors of gray or whatever to kind of make highlights and shadows. I find that if I do it now with oils like this, it's a lot more controllable because since they're oils, they can be removed very easily. If I mess this up, I can just take a little bit of thinner and wipe it all off. If I were to mess up color modulation with the airbrush, I'd have to repaint the model. I'm also going to add some streaks on the side here by just making some vertical streaks with the light blue color. I'm picking a light blue because it's kind of the lighter version of the super dark blue on the tank. Once again, I'm taking my brush with a tiny, tiny bit of thinner and just rubbing up and down until these are like 90% blended out. You just got to keep rubbing and keep rubbing and if you're not getting anywhere, add a little bit more thinner to your brush and keep going. And in a minute or two, you'll have these super subtle streaking effects which adds some interest to the flat one color side of the tank. So these MIG ammo oil brushes are kind of in interesting. It's basically a mascara bottle full of oil paint. But it comes with an applicator built in, which is sometimes kind of useful. So I'm, I'm using the two colors here, the Starship Filth and the Dust, to make basically dusty, dirty effects on the lower areas of the tank. And as before, we get a little bit of thinner on our brush, a little, little bit of thinner on the brush, and then we blend them out. I'm applying it in little dots just so I can blend it out easier in small little controlled areas. Now the most important part of this oil weathering stage here is to only use a little bit of thinner on your brush. If you have too much, you'll wipe all the oil paint off. You want to leave a little bit to add that kind of tint of the brown or the blue color. So now we're just applying more dots, same as before, both colors back and forth. And once again, just blending it out. This is actually basically as easy as it looks. You just apply little dots, get a little bit of thinner, and rub them down, and it, it's pretty convincing the ended result. This was my first time with the MIG ammo oil brushers, and honestly I kind of got tired of unscrewing those bottles and then putting some dots on, screwing them back on, screwing the lids back off, and screwing them on again. So I just took them out and applied a little bit of oil paint from them to my palette next to the Wilder oil paints. So, you know, it, they're a very good quality oil paint, the MIG ammo oil brushers, but I found that the actual tube itself was a little bit gimmicky and a little bit frustrating after a while. 
So here I'm applying some of the oil brusher paints. This is the dust color. This is the uh, starship filth color. And then I also added some of the wilder dust there, which is basically the white color. And then kind of like what I was doing before with the blue, I'm blending this out to make some subtle streaks on the side. And the previous blue isn't really getting wiped off here because I'm only using a little bit of thinner on my brush. So it's only really moving around the super fresh oil paint. Basically this whole effect is just blending, 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 blending. But honestly, the result is pretty amazing and it's like everything I'm doing here. It's actually pretty straightforward. Don't be intimidated by this. You just apply a little bit of oil paint and just kind of rub it away until there's only a little bit left. Oil paints are great for weathering because they have a long drying time and they can be completely removed. So like I said, don't be worried. You have a lot of time to blend out the effect, and if you don't like it, just get some thinner, and wipe it all off, and start over. It's not going to damage your previous weathering effects because you apply that varnish, remember? And using just those three dirt colored oil paints as well as the blue, we've got some excellent color modulation and dust effects built up on the upper surface of our tank. And as a last little touch, I actually use some of the Starship Filth, the brown oil paint color from Megamo, and just made a couple of little streaking effects on the rear here, just to make the tank look a little bit greasy and dirty. And here is our tank with the completed oil weathering effects. Now oils are probably the weathering effect that I enjoy the most. It's super fun to do this stuff because it's like I can just sit down for a couple hours and just kind of just do the whole thing. These oil paints are super forgiving because, you know, they can be re-thinned and removed if you don't like the effect. But they also dry really slowly, so it's super easy to blend them out. And once they're dry, you can apply another layer on top, and you won't damage the previous layer. And the end result is these beautiful, subtle variations in the blue and the dust and the grease and everything like that. Oil paints are incredibly powerful for weathering. They're super forgiving. Super easy, and you can do basically anything by just layering on different colors of oil paint. I highly, highly recommend oil paints for weathering. They're probably the best thing out there for it. The rest of this video is basically just going to be me covering all the lower hull weathering effects. So this is the fun part for some people. I've got four pigments here from Wilder. Uh, honestly, I only really needed to use probably the dark one, the light one, which are the dry European mud and the old grease. The other ones were kind of questionable if I actually needed them. Uh, I've got the Wilder Dark Russian Textured Earth here, which is actually an acrylic product, but it's very useful. I also have some Wilder Enamel Thinner and some water. And I also have some of the MIG Ammo Oil Brushers here from previously, same colors. And I've also got some Tamiya X22 Clear Gloss Paint from previously, as well as some Wilder Textured Snow. I got a whole bunch of brushes here, all different shapes and sizes just for whatever I want to do with the effects, be it blending or small applications. I begin by applying some of the Dark Russian Textured Earth from Wilder, and the point of this first layer of it here is to just give us the texture. So the color doesn't really matter, I just want to give us some texture that will then be covered up by the pigments later, and give us that kind of convincing built up earthy texture. So kind of Keep in mind where the mud's going to build up the most, which is on the upper surfaces of parts that don't move. Like I said previously, this is actually an acrylic product, so I can actually take a little bit of water right after I put it on and blend it out a little bit. But once this dries, I can't take it off because remember, it's an acrylic. Like I said previously, acrylics are not removable. Though if you want to remove an effect, you want to use an enamel or an oil paint. So there's the uh, textured earth product in the tank. Just it gives us a nice initial kind of I don't know, roadmap for where we want to apply the pigments and stuff for the later dirty and dusty effects. So here's all four of my pigments. Now you can probably use less pigments than this, but you really want kind of a dark one and a light one at least. So it looked kind of crazy here, but really I'm just applying the pigments starting at the bottom with the darkest color, which in this case is the old grease color, which is basically like a super dark brown. 
and then I'm using the dark brown here, which is a little bit lighter, and I'm applying that a little higher up. And then I've got some dark European terrain, I think, is the color here, which is even a little bit lighter than that, and I'm applying that a little higher than the previous ones. And then I'm going to apply the dry European earth, which is even lighter, once again even higher up than the previous ones. So the result is kind of a gradient from light higher up to dark lower down. And that gives us like variation from dust down to mud. Now to fix it on, because I don't want the pigments to fall off, I'm applying some of the wild art enamel thinner to the pigments. Enamel thinner has super low uh, surface tension. If, we're, if you were to use like water mixed with white glue for this, it would kind of move the pigments around. So enamel thinner is very good. And now I'm streaking it down right after I apply the enamel thinner. So it's still wet. And I'm just streaking it right away. And this is to give us kind of dusty streaking effects. I was honestly making this up as I went, but it came out looking pretty cool. So we're going with it. Now once that had dried, I then started applying some of the lightest dusty pigment again over top. Only a little bit though, because I don't want to cover up those nice streaking effects. This is just to give us a hint of dust back to the effect. But I still want those darker effects showing in there and also the streak showing in there. So just be very careful with this effect. Now I went back with the Dark Russian Textured Earth at the end, which is something I've never done before. But I want to try this out. So I'm putting it back on at the super, super low regions of this mud to kind of make a wet effect, I think. Or just kind of give us some color back to it. Make some kind of like splattery wet effects, sort of. So I'm kind of like stippling this on, kind of doing weird splatter motions. Uh, I don't know, I was, making this, I was making this up as I went along, as I said, but the result was very nice. This layering came out very good in the end. And here is the result of the mud effects in the lower hull. Now I think this came out amazing considering I had no idea what I was doing. We've got dust areas, we've got streaks, we've got wet areas, dirt, mud, everything. And they're always they're all in the right spots. The dust is high up, the mud is low down, close to the ground where everything's all wet. And I'm going to briefly show the same kind of thing on the front here. I don't want to keep you guys bored, so we're going to go through this pretty quick. But basically first textured earth, dark pigment, here's the medium pigment. Then we have after this the lightest pigment to get that variation from dust to dirt to mud with the three pigments respectively. After that's blended out a little bit, we just kind of uh, put on some of the texture earth again at the very end to make sure we kind of re-emphasize those kind of wet low down areas. And that's a variation to the dust. I'm just kind of stippling this on in a weird motion, hoping it gives me kind of mud splatters. It's pretty easy. Now on the track wheel assembly here, I kind of streamlined it a little bit, so I got rid of some of the pigments, and we're only focusing on using first the textured earth. Once again, this is the Wilder Dark Russian textured earth. Nice dark green muddy color. This gives us the initial mud texture. Make sure that you don't put too much on the wheels, because remember these wheels spin around, so most of the mud would come off. Just keep it in like the, the areas where you think it would kind of cling on. There we go, there's our initial muddy buildup texture. And then we accentuate this by applying the pigments. Like I said, I kind of streamlined it and I only focused on using two pigments here, which is the old grease, the super dark color for the muddy wet effects. I'm keeping this mostly on the areas where I actually put the textured earth because that's supposed to be the mud. And then we use the dry European mud here, which is the lighter color. And this is our dusty effect. And just layer them back and forth a couple times. You know, it's mud. It's supposed to be messy. Have a little bit of fun here. Just kind of throw it on. You can't really mess this up. Like, it's mud. It's supposed to look bad. And there we go. Straightforward. Textured earth, two pigments. We've got dust. We've got mud. It looks great. Now for the tracks here. Tracks are always a little bit hard to weather. So I decided, why not just start with those two... Uh, oil brushers we used for the dusty effects on the upper areas of the tank. That way the whole kind of mud effect will blend together on the tank as a whole. So I'm using both the colors and keeping with everything else, you know, 
put some areas of the darker color, some areas lighter color, and that way you get variation. You get some dusty areas, and you also get some kind of darker wet areas. Now to blend it out, same wilder thinner as before. Only get a little bit on your brush, remember not too much, and then just blend it out. If you were to apply too much thinner here, you'd basically turn into a wash and it would all disappear. So you gotta make sure you're just kind of blending it in, not wiping it off. And then once the uh, oil paint was on, but still wet, I then applied the pigments over top of this. And basically I'm applying the light pigment in the areas where I applied the light oil paint, and the dark pigment in the areas where I applied the dark oil paint. But not exclusively, I kind of blend around a little bit. And like I said before, the, the result is you get dusty areas, wet areas, dry areas. It kind of all looks interesting because having a little bit of variation there is pretty cool. And with the oil paint still wet when I'm putting the pigments on, when the oil paint's dry, they'll help to bind on the pigments and they won't come off. And there we go. Looks pretty nice and it matches with the wheels. And now we get to put that whole assembly on the side of the tank there. I actually, find, I actually found this whole kind of wheel track assembly very, very convenient because it kind of simplified all the weathering and painting down to just like one step. Instead of painting each wheel individually, I did them all at once along with the tracks. Now we're going to use some of the Wilder Textured Snow product to add a little bit of snow to the tank. This is very similar to the textured earth we were previously applying in that it's a acrylic effect with a slight texture to it. This also is an acrylic, so make sure you thin it with water if you want to, not with enamel thinner. I added this note to the tank because these Thermian Fujika Suits 33 mostly fought in Stalingrad, and we like to think of Stalingrad as being a little bit cold. So this is a nice touch to the vehicle, and also the box art for the kit was beautiful Ron Volstad artwork that showed the vehicle in gray with a little bit of snow on the ground. And that kind of inspired me to add a little bit of snow to the tank here to give it that Stalingrad feel and make it look like it's just been driving through maybe the first fresh dusting of snow. So there's no whitewash in the tank, but it still looks pretty cool with this light dusting of snow. Make sure you keep the snow around the very low areas, kind of where the mud is because it kind of accumulates in the same way. Now we're going to use this Tammy X22 clear gloss paint straight out of the bottle to give us some glossy effects to accentuate the mud and the snow. This will give us that kind of glossy sheen of wet snow and mud and it just adds a nice little touch to your tank. So I'm brushing it on all the snow as well as some of the heaviest mud areas like right there. And it kind of looks like mud, grease, anything like that. It looks wet, it looks cool. If you've ever been to like a, like a tank show you see that when these tanks drive by, they are really greasy. So I even put a little bit of it on the upper surfaces here near the gun. There's a little bit of like drips there from the gun. Because the gun's greasy and this looks pretty cool. Also put a little bit of the snow and the glossy effect near the rear hatches where the crew would walk up and drag a little bit of snow with them as they went. This is just another way to accentuate the, um, the crew hatches along with the chipping and other dusty effects we put up there. Now here is our tank with the completed lower hull weathering effects. I think this looks awesome. The snowy dust on there is super cool. Gives it that nice authentic Stalingrad feel. And the uh, the mud effects, the built up layering in there, I'm super happy with it. We've got, like I keep saying, we got variation. Dust, dirt, mud, wet, snow, dry, everything's on there. You can see the grease streaks on the back there. Grease streaks around the uh, shock absorber. This is just... So much fun to put this stuff on. It looks great. The grease you put around the gun here also looks really nice when you catch in the light. Looks super cool. And overall, like I said, super happy with this. It was completely made up as I went along, um, but the end result was very nice, so hope you maybe learned something new there and how to layer your mud effects. But those spare tracks at the front are missing something. The last step in the weathering procedure on this tank was the rust effects on the spare track. For this effect, we're going to use a Wilder 
dark rust effect here, which is an enamel product, very similar to the oils we were previously using. And I've also got three pigments here. I've got light rust for some rust effects. I've got brown Russian earth for like a nice oxidized gray steel color. And I've got dry European mud, which is what we were previously using for the dust effects. And I've also got a number 10 round brush from previously that's basically destroyed by this point. We're going to start by applying the enamel effect over the entire tracks. These tracks were previously base painted with the 50-50 mix of XF72 and XF69 that I showed at the very beginning of the video. I thinned down the enamel effect with a little bit of the Wilder enamel thinner, just a little bit because it was a little bit thick to my taste. And then I just kind of applied it kind of like a filtery overall wash sort of thing, just throwing it on there. But depending on how much you apply to each individual link, you can get variations in the rusty effect. With the enamel effect dry, I then started by dusting on the pigments. So first we're applying the light rust color to give us some very subtle rust effects. I'm keeping this mostly around the links that got more of the previous enamel effect and that, that are therefore a little bit more rusty already. But don't overdo with the rust because these tracks didn't really get that rusty in real life. So I'm only putting on a couple of links and keeping it really refined. Next up, Brown Russian Earth. This is what I apply over most of the tracks. I like this color a lot. It gives me a nice kind of steel matte finish color. And lastly, we apply a little bit of the dry European mud pigment to give some kind of variation to the gray and the rust and also to kind of blend in the tracks with the previous dusty effects on the tank because this is the pigment that we were previously using on the rest of the vehicle. Once it was on, I gave it a little bit of mud and snow at the bottom just to make it blend with the rest of the tank nicely. If you're curious about seeing more rust effects, I have a video entirely focusing on rusty tracks that I'll link up in the top right corner if you want to see more. But as for this vehicle, I think I nicely nailed the balance between having enough rusty contrast between each link to make it interesting and between not making it so contrasty that it looks like it doesn't belong in the tank. My advice here is to always keep your rusty effects nice and toned down. And with that, we've completed the weathering procedure on our tank. The end result is just what I was hoping for. I didn't want to go overboard with like rust effects, chipping everywhere, streaking everywhere. I was aiming more for what I expected of like a realistically weathered tank at least, or something that you know has only survived a couple of months at most in combat doesn't have too much chipping, there's no rust streaks, it's just you know, light chipping, subtle wear and tear, mostly just built up dust and dirt and grease. You know, just it's been driving around Stalingrad for a while. It hasn't been surviving years on the Eastern Front. I hope that you've enjoyed watching me weather this vehicle. Maybe you've picked up a couple of tips of your own. I definitely learned some new things, especially on the lower hull here where I kind of layered those pigments on and then brush them down with an ammo thinner to get those streaks going. That was pretty cool, and uh, I also like the, the greasy gloss effects that used up on the front hair on the gun. I'm also happy with my rust effects on the tracks there, as well as what I was talking about earlier when I said I didn't know how really how to do wood. Well, what I did on the axe, I was very pleased with as well. If you have any questions or comments, please, by all means, post them on below. I always try to answer all the questions out there, and if they're really good, sometimes I'll even do a video response where I'll do a demonstration or a little bit of a discussion about whatever question you had. And of course, all the weathering effects I showed here, you can put your own spin on them. You can use different products than what I use. You can use different brands. You can use enamels where I used oils. This is, like I said at the beginning of the video, just meant to be more of a guide and inspiration for how you can use certain effects and what products you can use to create whatever desired weathering techniques you'd like. I would like to give a huge thank you to all my, all my Patreon and PayPal supporters. You guys are awesome and give me a little bit of money every month, which helps me buying all the paints and products and everything that you're seeing me use in these videos. It's super generous and it's much appreciated. I'd also like to thank Luke Steele, who provided some of the music for me, which I'm playing in the background of this video. And I'd also, of course, like to thank everybody who's been watching my video here. It means a lot to me. And I always like seeing your comments on below. 
So like I said already, hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you learned something new. The next standard weathering procedure video, I'm not sure what it will be. Maybe olive drab, maybe Russian 4BO green, maybe NATO camouflage. But I want to cover all three of those at least in the future sometime. So look out for those coming up soon. And I will see you next time. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you then. Happy modeling.